Bon. Bonjour à tous. Euh, donc, euh, L'Institut national de l'histoire de l'art et le château de Fontainebleau, vous souhaite la bienvenue pour cette neuvième édition du Festival d'histoire de l'art. C'est la neuvième édition du Festival d'art historique. Cette conférence sera donnée par Hannah, by Marit uh, Pasha sur Hannah Riggins, Embroidery as a Resistance Tool. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about Hannah Riggen. And one of the things that I really, really like about Hannah Riggen's art is how explicitly it shows that in her case, life and art truly were one and the same. There is no separating the two. She used herself and her life in her art. Art was her voice. And as I will show you, she was not afraid to use it. Her art is highly original in its combining international modernism with politics and folk art. And Riggen was, in the Norwegian context, quite unique in parlaying art into activism. Her art accommodates everything from eco-philosophical uh, reflections and ideas about motherhood, to critiques of privilege, abuse of power, and social hierarchy. Now, um, embracing the idea of the under-recognized female artist has become a popular trend in the recent years. We see this in the revitalized interest in the careers of Hilmar Klint, Paula Modersen Becker, Sonia Deloni, Carol Rama, and Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven. And I support this work because it is a correction of an extremely male dominated account of modernism. Yet it is also interesting to note how, in lifting female artists out of obscurity and focusing attention on their greatness, we almost automatically assume that these women were marginalized or overlooked in their own time. And I actually assume that this was the case as well with Hannah Riggen when I began working on my book, Hannah Riggen, Threads of Defiance. Yet, when I sat down and went through all of the archival material, it proved otherwise. As opposed to many of her female artist colleagues, Riggen was declared a genius by a number of art critics, and that was mainly male artists, in the 1930s and 40s. She exhibited on a regular basis internationally, and her success was indisputable. In 1962, she had one of the most popular and well-attended shows in the Moderna Museet's history, the Moderna Museet's in, in Stockholm, and she was also part of the Venice Biennial in 1964. So, in other words, there were no marginalized or misunderstood artists I was dealing with. Not in her own time, anyway. What was shocking was how little place she was allotted in the written Norwegian art historical record later on and especially in the art historical survey books from the 19, 1980s and 90s. But that is a topic for an entirely different lecture. So we will, in turn, we will turn instead back to the beginning, to the point where everything began. And here you can see Hanna Riggen to the left with her sister Agda and brother and mother and father. Um, she was born in the Swedish city called Malmö in 19, 1894. She grew up in a working class household and was initially trained to be a primary school teacher. Teaching, however, did not agree with her. And much suggest that the major Baltic exhibition in Malmö in 1914 inspired her to explore art. Here you see her as a teacher. 
And this is Hanna Regin's access card to the Baltic exhibition. And the Baltic exhibition featured vanguard Russian, Swedish, and German paintings. And the visitors could experience such as Kadinsky's painting, composition number six from 1913, and also many examples of German expressionism from the Brücke artists, as well as a large selection of applied artworks and Swedish handicrafts. This is from the section devoted to Swedish handicrafts. And I actually had this woman sitting there for the whole exhibition period, weaving. Two years later, in 1916, Hanna Regin began studying with a German-Danish painter called Fredrik Krebs, and he was living in Lund. She was employed, sorry, she was employed as a teacher at that time. Uh, so every day after work, she took the train from Malmö to Lund uh, to study freehand drawing, mixing pigments, uh, composition, and perspective along with other students. And you see her here. She's sitting with the other students and this is Krebs, her teacher. And these are examples of freehand drawings from that period of time. This is a self-portrait from a sketchbook. And this is um, a landscape drawing from 1918. And as you can see, she was trained in a naturalist style. So Mr. Krebs, he loved Rembrandt, but Hanna Ryggen was quite uncomfortable with what she felt was an outdated mode of expression. And we can see a glimpse of the transformation her style went through when she started weaving at Erlana. And Take a close look at this painting. And then you see this sketch for a pillow called um, the Northern Lapwing, which is much more modernist in the style. And that is made around 1925. In 1922, Krebs recommended that Rügen travel to Dresden to study the old masters and further develop her technical skills as a painter. And during this tour, she also met her husband-to-be, the Norwegian painter Hans Ryggen. They married in the autumn of 1923, and she moved, late in, late in her own pregnancy, to Ørlanda, which is a very flat, windswept, coastal region in the middle of Norway in February 1924. Now, while Riggin was no sheltered aristocrat, life in Ørlanda was still a far cry from city life in Malmö. Rennan, or the shack as they lonely christened the little house that Hans had built, had no running water, no electricity, um, before 1944. On this farmland, they cultivated grain, they grew vegetables, and kept livestock. And it was in these Spartan conditions that Muna, their daughter, was born in May 1924. No, sorry. And you see them here sitting outside of the house. And I think you can't even imagine how poor they were. Um, but both Hans and Hanna, they worked as painters and farmers first. What is interesting is that Hanna, when she chose weaving instead of painting, 
she brought all of her painter's knowledge and political fervor to bear in her weaving. And it took her a decade, 10 years, to master the medium. And when I say master the medium, I think of composition, often with, with respect to an outsized scale, carding, spinning, weaving techniques, and not at least making dyes from plants. Extracting colors from the natural terrain that surrounded her and controlling the sophisticated chemical processes that rendered color stable over time was the result of laborious experimentation. But once she had this knowledge at her fingertips, she felt free to express herself. And it was not decorative patterns that she put in the warp, but the challenging national and international political issues of the day. And here you see Fishing in the Sea of Depth, which is from 1933. And it's one of the first truly successful monumental tapestries Hanna Riggin created. And the subject is the harsh social conditions and consequences of the devastating economical crisis that struck Norway and many other countries in the 1930s. And during the worst year, in 1933, over one-third of the organized workforce was unemployed. And several were ruined by overwhelming debt. And fishermen, many of them in Erlanda, were among the hardest hit. And Riggen found the injustice of the situation that banks prospered on people's insolvency to be intolerable. And she states in one of her letters that every man and woman, whether rich or poor, ought to be raised capable of two things, producing their own food and supporting themselves. It is an indignity that some serve others. Everyone should work. No one should be above another. Equality for all mankind. We are all flesh and blood, just the same. The farm and the livestock were the lifeblood of their little family. And Hanna, she really loved her animals. She once even convinced her cousins in Sweden to send her goose eggs and managed to hatch them with the help of an obliging turkey. And you can see her here. She is sitting with the goslings. And look at the way that she holds the grown up goose in one arm. This is one of a tapestry called uh, It's Us and Our Animals. It's from 1934 the year after she makes Fishing in the Sea of Depth. And it's nearly two by five meters long. So here, Riggin aban abandoned her early attempts to achieve smooth transitions between hues. Instead, the composition is built up around large color fields. And here we find a portrait of the little family. You see Hanna and Mona, and they are feeding the animals. And here you have Hans with a horse. And in the middle, we see them sitting around the table. And in front here, it's the main subject. It's the goose which has been um, decapitated. And Riggen herself described this in these words. This is, us for, no, this is us with our foal, Nussa, Ko, Meta. She had names for all the animals. Uh, the two sheep, Kakeleia the gander, and the turkey. I had 10 geese. We slaughtered all of them at the same time, and I haven't eaten goose since. It's to their memory that I have woven this tapestry. Now, there is a kind of a realism, a necessity in slaughtering animals. One does it to survive. Regardless, Hanna Riggen never took it lightly. The animals were important, 
and they were loved. The despair depicted in this image is almost palpable. And although uh, many aspects of daily life are well represented in European visual art of the 1920s and 30s, this is an unusual motive. And other artists who explore the expressive potential of weaving in textile media, such as the Russian-French artist Sonia Deloni or Sophie Tabe Arp, generally did so in a style that was keeping in with abstract and intensely colorful painting. In European art aspects of the everyday were first and foremost expressed as urban experiences. When nature appears as a subject matter, it was usually as a source of diversion, um, witalism and also romanticism, both in painting and photography. And if we look at the Norwegian art at, from the same period, nature figured primarily as an expression of national identity. But there is not an iota of romanticizing in us and our animals, nor is it any sugar-coated idea of nature. Nature for Hannah Regen was nothing abstract. It was experience. And the realism and despair in slaughtering animals came from lived experience, experience which relates this tapestry to fishing in the Sea of Debt. Well, um, nature was, or no, put it otherwise. The loom was the means, nature was the material. Nature provided light and colors, and the goal was to rest from it as many nuances as possible. In painting, color is something external spread onto the surface of a canvas. In Hannah Riggins' tapestries, on the other hand, color and the material are one and the same. An artist and critic, Else Christine, Else Christi Schellam, touches on the distinction in this text from 1939. And she writes, and I find this quite interesting, how seductive the material of these tapestries is, one doesn't grasp in the moment how inadequate the usual smeared pigments we other use are in relation to the material's effect, where the color is one with the material. One has only to recall, without compar comparison, however, the mosaics at Ravenna, where the stones lie and sparkle and glow, and the color is one with them. And if one thinks about it, it is actually just reasonable that modern painting seeks new materials, where the large areas of colored surface can get a new injection of life from the nature of the substance itself. It seems only natural. Anyone can do it. Hannah Regen has done it. So in short, uh, Shellan regards Regen's tapestries as modern painting, just taken one step further through the physical materiality. And I think that's an interesting observation that also feels relevant today. This is just a, this is an image from a Sunday trip they took. They often went on picnics on Sundays. And you see Hannah Regen in front, and in the middle you see the back head of uh, Muna, their daughter, and Hans. And this is Muna Regen. And you can see uh, the yarn is hanging uh, from the corner here and some of the very early tapestries that Hannah Riggen made. And the majority of Hannah Riggen's woven works are in, in fact, utilizations of the natural environment at Ørlanda. The entire attic, which you can see here, uh, was filled with skeins of yarn in innumerable use, created from goat willow bark, 
bird cherry, hair cap moss, birch leaves, heather, common lichen. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So all the colors she made, she made from nature. And every nuance of color corresponded to a specific entity in nature. So we are the production of color. Rügen took her place in the world out into a greater world. And with her choice of subject matter, the world at large was brought in closer to them. And I don't know if you're very familiar with the dyeing process, but there are a lot of variable, or yeah, there are many variables that have to be coordinated and controlled. And she writes a bit of this in her diaries, and they're quite uh, entertaining. And, and she wrote in a kind of rambling way. Uh, the leaves are boiled in water with the yarn. Then it's taken up and laid on a grassy turf and sprinkled with cold ashes. And turf is placed on top with the grassy side down. Can also become green by putting the yarn directly on the grass with ashes. And she also has another one. The yarn is cooked in whey along with the roots, placed hot in a tub and poured over with urine. Rinsed in cold water and hung warm in the shade. Can also be boiled with birch leaves. So Riggen had, in other words, quite an advanced knowledge of chemistry. Um, when she came to Erlanda, which is in the mid-Norway, on, on the coast, she made and sold craft items as a source of income. But she stopped doing so in 1933. And the large-scale weavings were extremely time-consuming and labor-intensive. And art was, for a very long time, uh, an, an economic drain for the family. And I found documents that shows that during the 14 years, from 1926 to 40, Riggen earned a total of 3,000 Norwegian um, kroner. Uh, and in comparison, an average yearly salary in 1930 was around 2,500. So in 14 years, she makes 3,000. And yet, despite extremely difficult means, Riggen never compromised. Not only did she give up making and selling arts, no, selling crafts, she also refused to sell her monumental weavings to private buyers. She wanted her works to be public statements. And for that reason, she felt that they should be publicly owned and hang where all citizens had access to them. And this is very clearly demonstrated in the exceptionally powerful series of anti-Nazi and anti-fascist tapestries that Riggen produced in Erlande from yeah, around 1935 to 1945. And these works are devoted to international political conflicts and circumstances in Norway under the German occupation. And I wanted to show you some of them. This tapestry is called Ethiopia. It was made in 1935. And it is about Italy's invasion of Ethiopia and the League of Nations' quite shameful and anemic response. And in this weaving, you can see uh, Hannah Riggen is, um, she depicts Mussolini's head skewered on a black man's spear. So she's leaving no ambiguity as to her standpoint. She wanted Mussolini dead. And this tapestry, Ethiopia, was shown in conjunction with the Paris Exposition in 1937. And the organizers 
fear that the subject matter would offend the Italian authorities. And they censored the work by folding over the portion containing Mussolini's head. And what's interesting is that um, Norway and Spain's pavilions when were neighbors in this uh, world exposition. And in, in the Spanish pavilion, they showed Picasso's Guernica, and it was not censored. The year after she makes Death, she makes, uh, Death of Dreams, 1936, and this is Hannah Riggin's defense of Karl von Osiecki, the German Jew and Polish Jew, and it's her protest against Hitler, Goebbels, and Göring. And the impetus for the work were Osiet was the Osiecki case and the Third Reich's increasingly more brutal and inhumane system of governance. And I don't know, are you familiar with the Osiecki case? No one, okay. Uh, in 1927, Osiecki became the editor, uh, chief editor of the newspaper Die Weltbühne, the world stage, a German newspaper. And under his management, it became the nexus for everyone that was opposed to the German uh, governing authorities. And in 1939, Osiecki was accused for high treason, treason and espionage and sentenced to one and a half years imprisonment for his role in exposing uh, Germany's Air Force rearmament and a breach of the Treaty of Versailles. He stayed in Germany, he could have, esca uh, have escaped, but he stayed in Germany because he believed the most effective resistance had to be waged within Germany itself. And but the day after the Reich, Reichstag fire in Berlin in 1933, Osiecki, along with many other opposition activists, was again imprisoned and charged with high treason. What is interesting is that with Osiecki's fate, it was very well known uh, through Europe and also in Norway. And with his fate, the political consequences of Hitler's government drew closer to Norway. In the tapestry, to the right here, we see Osiecki and he is handcuffed and behind bars. And to Osiecki's right, we have Goebbels, Göring and Hitler, and they form this, yeah, what you call a sinister triumvirate, propped on swastikas. And their fa faces and hands are driven up in, in uh, run up in purple, the color of madness with a trace of crimson. And Goebbels' hands, yeah, no. Gobble, he clasps his hands around the prisoner's neck and he hangs helpless in his clutch. But to the prisoner's right here, there's another group. And the main person here is Albert Einstein. And he's standing with a violin in his hand. And Einstein was a very um, prominent opponent of the Third Reich and contributed in nominating Osiecki for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1935. And the Peace Prize is award, it's handed out in Oslo, in Norway. But he wasn't awarded the prize before 1936. And that was a decision that caused a lot of stir in Norway. And he was frequently mentioned in the Norwegian press in these years, and he became a very powerful symbol of resistance. So with this tapestry, Death of Dreams, Hanna Riggin walked straight into a political discussion that was consuming the entire newspaper world, numerous authors, and also many ordinary citizens. And she said this herself about this tapestry, it's woven in 1936, 
three years after Hitler came to power. I called it death of dreams, because no all dreams were going to die. And um, Osiecki, he uh, died in custody in 1938. And the year after this one, she makes horror. Elle Gru in Norwegian, uh, in 1936. And here you can see the use of pattern and ornament is a quite important mechanism. And horror is both a manifestation of the Spanish Civil War and the consequences of that war and a very activist work. And the way that Rügen transforms the space into an interplay between surfaces in this work makes it easier to see what weaving and modernist painting have in common. As in Picasso's Guernica, there is no exterior or interior in horror's pictorial space. It's just a single surface that the figures are one with. So we are actually placed in a situation... No, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh... Sorry. Uh, we are placed in a situation that no doors can... That, I mean, we can't close any doors. There is no special um, construction that can shield us from witnessing what is happening. And we are forced to look upon this young girl sitting there, huddling alone as a bomber drives overhead. And the palette is dominated by a broad range of reds, reminiscence of blood, and the contrasting colors of untreated black wool and white. And as I already mentioned, Hannah Rigen dyed all of her wool herself, and each tone correspond to an ingredient from one specific part of the nature that surrounded her. So through this production of dyes, she connected her home place with the world. And in this case, Erlanda became a part of Spain and vice versa. So in 1940, the Nazis occupied Norway, and their presence were keenly felt by those living in Erlanda in Trøndelag as a hub in the middle of Norway, the region was of great strategic importance for the Nazis. And um, Albert Speer writes in his memoir, Inside the Third Reich, that Hitler had ambitious plan about this city. And he wanted an airport to be built at Erlanda. And this airport was actually constructed in the period of 1941 to 44 primarily with Russian and Serbian prisoners of war labor. So the point here is that um, the wartime acts of aggression played out with frightening clarity in front of Hans and Hanna Riggin's eyes. They witnessed torture and long processions of emaciated prisoners passing their house on their way to forced labor. And these are some of the photographs from Erland at that time. Here you see prisoners of war. And it's uh, taken from the construction of the landing strip for the airplane. And this is by the Droughty barracks where they lived. And of course, Erland is in Norway. And during the winter, the cold, uh, the snow, the lack of food made the life for the prisoners especially hard. And then, quite literally, a bit of light shone in this dark age. Because in 1944, because there were so many Nazis at Erlanda, electricity was install installed at the Czech. So after years of cursing the paraffin lamps and the long dark winters that made weaving so difficult, 
Rigen was elated. But happiness was soon overshadowed by a new catastrophe, because Hans Riggen, <laughs> sorry, Hans Riggen, her husband, was arrested by the Nazis in May 1944. And he was imprisoned, first at Falstad outside of Trondheim, and later Grini for having perpetrated illegal acts. And that is actually to say that he had having helped prisoners of war to escape. So Hannah was now alone on the farm, and she was trying to maintain their property. And she writes in one of her letters, all of our fields are full of weeds, and I have to clean potatoes and peas, etc., outdoors and inside. It's all work, never dreaming. And Hannah depicted this separation from Hans in this very beautiful and dreamlike tapestry called Grini, which she began working on early in 1945. And this palette is dominantly made of, made of shades of red. And you can see Hans is sitting here. You see him, everyone? Yeah. Um, and he is wearing a, a prisoner's uniform, which is number 13243, is prominently displayed. And he sits and paints skull and crossbone signs, which the Nazis posted in the minelands, minefields. Sorry. Along the far right edge of the work, Riggen has woven in a column-like structure from which several faces peer out. And directly above Hans' more worn face appears a barbed wire fence. And you can see those faces, they are looking at him and almost reminding him of what kind of destiny he can be facing. And there were a lot of artists at Grini at that time. From the left side of the tapestry, we see Mona, and she comes riding in on a horseback, as if in a dream or a folk tale. And she's nude, except for a swath of flowers that she holds in her hands. And a similar floral pattern appears under the hooves of the horse. And Hans was a painter that loved painting flowers. And behind Muna, you also see um, a kind of an open window and a flowery field that stretches out and houses in the landscape. And perhaps this is the shack at Erlana, we don't know. But the point is that Hanna sends her daughter, her messenger, to Hans. And she wants to bestow the dream, the ability to imagine two Hans. She seeks to pry open a way out of the enclosure. And actually, not long afterwards, uh, Germany capitulated and Hans was released. Now, I'm soon finished. But I think what is, because she makes several tapestries, I've just shown you a few of them. But after the world the Second World War is finished, she doesn't quit being political. Instead, she keeps herself engaged and she protests about NATO, the nuclear weapons. She protests about the Vietnam War, as we can see in this one, the latest I will show you. It's called Blood in the Grass. Uh, it's from 1966. And she's 72 when she makes this. <laughs> and I find it shockingly vital. <laughs> uh, and this is the first time that she ever uses artificial color. And you can see it in the blood red um, grid covering the fields of North Vietnam. And on the right side, you see the uh, American president Lyndon B. Johnson, and he is depicted with a cowboy hat and his very much photograph photographed dog. And there is also two kind of 
bright blue ribbons. And they contain missiles that Johnson's and USA is firing towards the communist North Vietnam. And the upper ribbon is running just in line with his hips. So maybe in order to imply that Johnson is shooting from his hip, just like a cowboy. OK, I wanted to end with saying that Hannah Riggen had this enormous confidence in art. With art, she was capable of saying anything. And she also relied on the impact of raising one's voice. And I do think we need to remember that politics is always focused on the future, where its consequences lay. And for me, Hannah Riggen's artistic legacy reminds us that art is part of public life and that it is inextricably bound to politics. And we are planning uh, the largest exhibition of Hannah Riggen's works in Europe at Schirn Kunsthalle in Frankfurt. And it will open um, the 25th of September this year. And you are all very welcome. Thank you. And please just ask questions if you like, if there are any. I just have one question. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating work. I wonder, um, when she was living in this isolated area, did she at all have connections to other artists, or was it kind yes, of... Yes, um, yes. She did. Uh, she had a lot of... Uh, con <laughs> She communicated quite well with other artists, and there were some in uh, at Trondheim, which is this uh, bigger city, not so far from Orlando. Uh, but there were also radio, and she was quite well connected, actually. Um, and she had some trips to Oslo, and she was, yeah, as I mentioned, she was very much exhibited from the nine, from around 1935 and upwards. So she traveled a lot to Oslo. They um, they financed her travels. Yeah. Okay. And she also, as she stayed in Paris for uh, seven months, in uh, just after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from 1946 and to 1947. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, Est-ce que vous pourriez revenir sur uh, ce qui a permis de donner une renommée à à Anna Riggen. Euh, finalement, comment elle a accédé à un statut d'artiste reconnu Vous avez parlé du fait que là, euh, elle, elle est... Yeah, when? Okay, yeah. Um, she has this exhibition in Oslo in 1935. And she was um, not a very shy person. She easily connected with other um both artists and, and well-known people in, in Norway. And 
before this exhibition. Now, she was married to Hans Ryggen, who was also uh, an artist, a painter, and he had uh, went through the Art Academy in Oslo. So he had uh, friends that were artists. So that's the main reason, yeah. Okay. Other things? Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually, because um, some of them, or we know just one of them, she mounted on the, um, uh, the wall outside of her house for the Germans to see. Uh, but either, I mean, maybe they just thought of her as, okay, she's a crazy woman making tapestry, and we don't have to, to take it seriously. Or she was born in Sweden. Uh, she had a Swedish passport. And Swedes were not to be touched in Norway during the Second World War. Because Sweden had this kind of um, alliance with the Germany that they were not uh, supposed to, they were not to do, do anything har to harm any Swedes. And I don't know. I don't know which one of those things. But I know that these are the most uh, reasonable answers. Yes. Okay. Thank you.